Hello ladies and gentlemen, I'm bringing you some more Cosmonarchy goodness. We're gonna go back to germination for this set of matches between Hamster and Veek7, some PVZ Q7. So let's take a look at Hamster in the top left and Veek7 in the bottom right. Oh wait, no, Veek is Protoss, this is PVP. I was misled. I just kind of assumed Veek would be practicing his Zerg, but I guess he wants to check out some Protoss behavior instead. Well, in that case, uh, yeah, just uh, ignore me. Ignore the guy talking about the game. He doesn't know what's happening in the game. And uh, yeah, let's just uh, br introduce you guys. So uh, mirror matchups always present an interesting avenue of exploration into the game because Cosmonarchy is very different than StarCraft 1. I mean, you can tell just by the way that the scribes look when they're called scribes instead of probes. And then the pylon looks funky and all that stuff. Uh, we also have all these custom tile set whatnot. You know, we got the cliffs on cliffs and we got the asphalt and jungle on desert. What's going on here? We got the extended ramps that look nice. We got. All sorts of wacky stuff going on. Who would have guessed? Uh, but some things are still the same, and that means that the gateway is still the same, uh, as well as the Nexus. However, the gateway does give you access to five units instead of uh, four, and the way that you get access to those five units are just by building the gateway, because there's 150 units, or ju just about anyway, in Cosmonarchy, and there are no upgrades, no supply, no researches, so the way that you tech up and upgrade your army is by literally getting better units, uh, or higher quantities of units, as it were. So it looks like we have a bit of a mirror opening so far with the pylon into gateway, the only difference is being the placement of the structures. Obviously, uh, Hamster's going to have to micro his scout a little bit. And look at that. A second gate has been scouted by Veek7's scribe. So what are we going to see out of that? Well, oftentimes, Protoss's mainstays have been Dracodins. But I have noticed that in PvP matchups, it is exceptionally powerful to just spam out Zealots. And the first unit of choice for Hamster here is a Zealot. You'll note that his first military unit is slower, partially because of worker kerfluffles, but also partially because of the fact that he's dipped into some Vespine a little bit later than his opponent, and on top of that, he has that second gateway much faster than his opponent. Avik is not going to be adding a second gateway, so it looks like he's going to be on the defensive as a result of that, because he cannot contend with his opponent's military production. Although his worker is not scouting down here to see whether or not the gateway is always blinking, we do have the, the work animation for the gateway, and for all structures, in fact, so you don't have that weird thing where you're like, well, is the gateway making something? And actually, you just saw it there. As soon as the worker leaves the vision radius, uh, you know, goes down the ramp and can't see up the ramp, uh, he actually cancels what the gateway was making so that he could make what he really wanted to make, which was a Hierophant. And Hierophants are these more gas-intensive units that are really, really good at disrupting early army movement thanks to their on-hit passive, which we'll talk a little bit about when we first see the Hierophant being made. Uh, I don't even think it's going to get any action here. Uh, but I suppose if it gets scouted, then, you know, Veek will have some value. I mean, it's not really the end of the world if you don't scout it because it's not like it auto wins the game for you but you'll see here it applies that blue uh effect on top of the unit that signifies that the unit will have lower movement rate uh so it's it's kind of like an on hit slow effect and if you stack it up enough times it actually turns into an on hit uh, attack rate effect so you'll attack slower as well as move slower it can be very powerful as a debuff and if you hit with, say, two Hierophants at once, then it stacks up twice as fast. The movement speed itself does not increase in severity, as far as the penalty goes, uh, but if you hit five times the same unit, then it will actually start to slow its attack rate instead of just its movement rate. Anyway, enough about that. We have a Legionnaire coming. That's another new unit for the Protoss arsenal. I'm not really a big fan of the SimCity here for Hamster because his workers, when he's transferring them or rallying them or whatever, are going to first come over here and then they're going to pop up to the gateway. You can see that, that little path there. He actually even intercepts it in the middle because I think his rally was uh, misplaced or something. But he's going to go ahead and use this Legionnaire. It's a very fast moving unit. It's faster than the Zealot. Uh, and he's actually going to be moving across the map with it just to use it as a scout, see if his opponent has a Nexus on the way. Uh, I would say that our mirror matchups in Cosmonarchy are significantly more strategically diverse than the mirror matchups in StarCraft 1 or StarCraft 2. And the reason for that is in large part due to the effect that you have so much tech depth that you have uh, at the beginning of the game. You can choose to funnel into a specific branch of your tech tree, which it could be like Bio or Mech for Terran, uh, or indeed Air even. Uh, if for Protoss, it's more like, do you have the Disciple tech, is what we call it, when we have like all these gateways and other such structures that are, fill that in, or do you go Robotics, or indeed, do you go for Sky Toss? And you can do all that stuff if you want to, uh, but you, you can also mix and match a little bit 
of surface level changes. Uh, we actually see double embassy over here. I'm really curious as to what that's going to be about. So embassy, instead of it being the forge, which has upgrades in StarCraft 1, and I guess StarCraft 2 as well, the embassy provides you with additional worker queues, and it also trains your witnesses, your observers, uh, your uh, envoys, your shuttles. Uh, those are the uh, the new names for those particular units. So, uh, And it will also allow you to tra field additional uh, worker types, the advanced worker, which can harvest without the need to return resources to a nexus. So you can actually use it. It's a flying worker. You can use it to harvest this little ridge up here in the back, which is not normally accessible. And you can also use it to harvest uh, distance mining because there's no efficiency penalty for it. So those are some of the things that you can do with the embassies. Maybe that's what Hamster is thinking. He's going to send one of his scribes across, which should probably be a little bit weird to Veek, actually. Like, why would you scout with a, a worker this late into the game when you have access to Legionnaires, you have access to Zealots, and so on? And the composition for Veek is very different than the composition for Hamster. He does have some Zealots, but most of his front line is actually the Legionnaires, the Spearmen. And then he's got Ecclesiasts, which are these shorter range units that are going to be useful for healing the shields of things like fr front line, you know, Zealots, Ecclesiasts, etc. Basically, when the Ecclesiast attacks a target, any allies near that target will get a shield boost. So that's how that particular interaction works. So we're going to see a good amount of sustain here, despite the Legionnaires being more fragile on paper than the Zealots. However, is it going to be enough? I mean, the Hierophants, they struggle versus crowds, so this force looks pretty scary for Veek. He is going to force his opponent back. The Ecclesiast staying alive, but the front line's about to fall away. So the Scribes are actually going to be used a little bit offensively here, or maybe defensively would be the better route. But he does need more Zealots, and you can see him canceling some of the units out to see if he can do that. He's put down a second pylon, but it's a little bit on the later side. And now the scribes are indeed going to go ahead and attack. There's so many Ecclesiasts over here that they can indeed overheal these units. It's sort of like the dynamic of having a lot of healers as Terran in Cosmonarchy, where if you have a lot of clerics, you can just focus uh, heal like one unit because there's no limitation on how many units can be healed at once. And so this is actually going to be called very early on in favor of Veek, thanks in large part due to his use of the Ecclesiasts. And this is a unit that hasn't seen that much usage. Uh, as of right now on pre-release, we do have a, a buff to the unit, which increases the radius of its uh, restore effect, so it heals more units at once, but I think that fight would have gone the same way no matter what, because it wasn't really like there was focus fire on the extremities or you know anything like that. I, Hamster went for a very greedy play with the double embassy to get all those workers out, and then he got punished for it. So that's where we stand, but we have a couple more games to get through, so let's check out game number two. Okay, we are back in action here. This time around, Veek is Zerg, and we have the same spawns on Germination. I liked that little play from Veek uh, to go for the Ecclesiast. It's a unit that we don't see too much of, so I'm glad that he was uh, willing to give it a quick test now that it had been buffed on this very version of the game for the first time. And I think now some people playing on pre-release have probably put it through its paces a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, I, I like the idea, basically, that the, the concept behind the buff to the Ecclesiast, and just for clarity's sake, unlike StarCraft 1, we are still figuring things out for Cosmonarchy. It is not at all a solid, saved situation, where, or solved situation, where we've uh, entirely figured out exactly what the meta is going to look like, and how everything's going to play out, and what the matchups are. We're not really looking at win rates for percentages. We're not really looking at, like, individual reports of people saying, oh, this is hard, this is easy, this is, uh, you know, annoying, this is uh, not annoying. We need a lot of data for that sort of thing. And so I definitely think that there's a lot more to be discovered for Cosmonarchy. Uh, and, you know, we're, we may not ever discover the limitations of it. I would say it, you could even argue, and you can make a compelling argument, in my opinion, from a design standpoint, that actually... Uh, we don't really know what the state of Cosmonarchy is, uh, and we don't even know what the state of StarCraft 1 is, despite that game being way, way older than StarCraft 2 and other RTS games and still being actively played at a high level professionally with a lot of players sort of duking it out constantly, right? So in that kind of context, okay, what can you really say about uh, about how solved something is or how explored something is? When you have 150 units, you get such a combinatorial explosion of potential combinations and uh, potential compositions of units. It's very exciting, but it is something that means that necessarily there's probably going to be a lot of ebb and flow where, oh, this strategy looks really powerful, and then conversely, this strategy looks really weak, and maybe somebody will find a use case for it, and maybe that will completely change the whole idea and identity of what that thing is, and suddenly people think, wow, I can't even believe I was never doing this in the first place. Speaking of, we do have a proxy warden. I'm not sure that this will ever be the strongest thing in the world, but, you know, Veek has gone for a greedy hatch first. His uh, structure will be able to reveal this now, especially since his worker has also seen it. He is going to need to pull workers for this. So his den is actually coming. He went for a greedy, very, very greedy situation here where he went for a den. 
He's gonna put down a Zerketh. I guess that's okay, but he doesn't have an Avalith to reposition it. That's gibberish if you don't know what Zerg is in Cosmonarchy, but basically you can take what was formerly known as the Overlord, and you can transport some of your structures, like the unmutated static defenses, and move them closer and then mutate them, but it's a lost cause in this situation. All he's basically doing is safeguarding from future uh, Wardens encroaching, but that's already done by the Kagra, which is our name for the Creep. A Dracodon has arrived on the front lines, and we do have three Hydras being made, so this isn't unbustable. Uh, Hamster doesn't want to lose the scribe. If, in fact, if uh, if Veek was really on his ball, he would have actually just killed the scribe with three hits of the circuit, and then a lot of this would have uh, gone the other way. Now look at this. We have the Hydra's hatching. It's going to be more than enough to deal with the Dracodon. Uh, maybe he'll get a worker kill. No, it looks like Hamster's not even going to do that, unfortunately for him. And so the scribe will end up going down. But you could kind of see the vision of what was going on here. Now the cliff advantage is going to allow the Warden to be engaged upon sort of when the Hydra's want. And so they can kind of burrow and maybe see if they can like break the shields enough to do some hull damage and then burrow to heal faster and sort of do that sort of thing. But, you know, you're on a ticking clock because this Hatcherosk is getting shelled and pelted by that one uh, warden in the front. We've got a second gate coming. No expansion yet. Uh, worker count obviously still favoring Hamster, but who knows how long that will last. And we do have a lot of Hydras being made, right? And so eventually you get enough Hydras, you can just smack this over. And what Hamster really has to worry about is uh, he can't continue the aggression. I don't know if he would have been able to continue the aggression with the Dracodon, but he probably would have been able to, like, fight a little bit better. And you can see Veek is planning out his angle of attack. Uh, one of his units almost got pulled in there on, on the auto aggro. Oh, he's, a, he's getting a little bit of uh, hits here. The Legionnaire is going to see if it can ward him away. Hey, so far that's actually not too bad. He has lost two Hydras now, hemorrhaging these. Oh, one more. Oh, but he changed target. Or maybe it just changed target on its own. Not sure. Might have just been very, very barely out of range. Legionnaire actually going to jump back over here. But that safeguards the Hatcherosk. So, you know, that had to happen at some point. We have another Kagrin starting, which is interesting. The, the Legionnaire is just trying to do some damage, and the way flash shielding works for Protoss is that if they haven't taken damage in two seconds, they heal at a rate of 10 shields per second. Sounds really high, sounds really fast. Uh, even some people like Veek himself has reported before that he thinks that maybe it's like uh, really, really strong and like overly so and needs to be nerfed, but... In practice, I, I actually haven't seen it abused yet, so maybe that's something, again, we, I, we were talking about, has it been solved? Has the game been significantly adjusted or what? Uh, turns out, like, yeah, we, we don't know yet. You know, that's something that hasn't been, you know, exhaustively abused by really, really, really high-scale players. You know, we don't have any top-tier Korean pros or anything playing Cosmonarchy yet. Not yet. I'm sure we'll do secure a show match at some point. But yeah, with all that said, uh, one of the things that I would say is uh, really cool about Cosmonarchy so far is that we do just see such a breadth of strategies. I talked about our mirror matchups being really different, in my opinion, than uh, a lot of situations. A lot of star uh, other RTS games forget about StarCraft games. Look at the double assembly play, uh, double uh, embassy play, excuse me, happening again. Dude, if he had double assembly this early in the game, I'd call him a Terran hacker because Nanite assembly is for, uh, for heavy Terran air. So imagine that. A little bit of a flubbed uh, Burrow Micro there is going to lose another Hydra, but finally the Wardens are gone. And at this point, you know, we see the workers are coming, but obviously Hamster has no way of confirming that. So he does have to worry about a potential Hydra bust, and he's counting on his Legionnaire count to be more than enough to deal with this. So again, I I'm not actually sure of how I feel about this strategy, but it's not like on its face terrible. It's just I'm curious about it, right? I actually don't know what to expect about a situation like this. Three gate, two embassy. What's he going to use the embassies for? Looks like it's just workers. He's going to really try to outproduce workers uh, for his opponent. And, you know, you want your game to be about making military as well. So if this ends up being a dominant strategy in the future, that could be kind of an interesting alternative that you might even have to watch out for. But it uh, looks like this worker is indeed going to get caught up. The Legionnaire teleportation works that they have to proc it. They have to tag a unit, and then they can uh, proc it by... Uh, teleporting to it within a certain minimum range check. And actually, that minimum range, I was thinking it should probably get a range bonus if you're on a cliff, just like you get an attack range bonus on a cliff. Dude, imagine that. Or if they could leap out from anchors, if they were garrisoned into anchors, and the anchor gave them the bonus. <laughs> I don't know. Stuff like that is, is kind of funny. Uh, also, the Magister passive, which is another Protoss unit you can make, uh, extends range by plus two. You imagine that uh, the range bonus of the Magister should also apply. Third base on the way for Veek, and uh, his worker almost got caught there, but there's only one Legionnaire. So he's going to throw down a hatch just to cover the ramp over here. That's a very common usage of the uh, macro hatches in Cosmonarchy is to cover the maps. Obviously, the maps themselves represent yet another thing that we're still learning about and, and considering and improving upon. So that's uh, that's another thing that you got to watch out for. And we did have double Ecclesiast come out of that last production cycle, but it's all workers all the time. You can see the worker count going super high. And as a result, Hamster is able to afford an Ancestral Archives. That's a tier four Protoss structure. Protoss the only ones who have conceptually 
access to a tier four, uh, but they have no tech requirements. So it's not really the same thing as the other races where they have to make a centralized tech node in order to properly get out, out there. Now, uh, Legionnaires are not ideal at dealing with balls of Hydras, nor are they ideal with, you know, breaking positions like uh, with structures involved because they just don't do that much damage. But the Lachizalisks have arrived and those deal plenty of damage to the crowds. So this will have to be uh, warded off, I think. Maybe he can uh, isolate onto the first Lachizalus, but there is another one there, and it is doing a lot of damage despite the Ecclesiast's best efforts, but this is clearly working out better than maybe if he was anticipating. However, he will be able to pick off at least one of those Ecclesiasts if he steps forward. No, it looks like he doesn't, so never mind. Tells a lie is me. Uh, and we do have a Nexus coming very late. You know, you look at the mineral float there. Uh, Hamster could have done that a lot sooner, but he was very focused on the micro. With a thousand minerals in the bank, he's looking to augment his production. He's adding some wardens, I guess for anti-drop or some other concern. Uh, could definitely be adding more gateways here and maybe some redundancy pylons. It looks like that's what that is. His uh, crucible will immediately start making, or sorry, his ancestral archives will immediately start making an optecton. Crucible's a different structure. I promise I'm not saying random words. Even assembly was technically a structure. It's just not, not the right race. <laughs> when you have 150 units, guys, you go through a lot of names. So the witness is obviously going to be useful here for, versus the Lachizalisks. That's why it was made, so you don't have to stand on it to reveal it. But there's not really a whole lot over here for uh, Hamster to hold on to. He's going to have to pull the scribes at some point to get them out of here so that the Lachizalisks don't just ruin his, his whole day. More of them kind of streaming on in. This is a little bit awkward because the Ecclesiasts are able to get a little bit of cliff bonus, uh, range bonus, jumping down here. The witness has also been misplaced, I think, in the middle of the fight. I'm not really sure where it went off to. Looks like one of them's down here and the other one's off to the 12 o'clock position. So now all of those workers that uh, Hamster made are being uh, tickled to death by some Hydras. The Nexus will be busted. The Uptecton's about to be finished, so I think this push will be taken care of. But again, there's no witness over here to detect. He's totally misplaced it. And look at this. I like the, the burrow. I think that was clearly a mistake. But the, uh, yeah, the Uptecton is going to rack off a couple of shots. Uh, this Nexus being over here, if V can kill it, which it doesn't look very likely, admittedly, the Legionnaire is still able to... Oh, no, no, no more Legionnaires here. So he still cannot do it, but the Witness is on the way. So yeah, th this Nexus will be just fine. Uh, the Uptecton still here, getting that plus uh, two range. Unfortunately, not quite able to uh, finish the job onto these Hydras. But again, there's Legionnaire reinforcements. Looks like uh, Veeks pulled back some of his forces to try to centralize his next round of units. He's making a ski-backed scab behind this. The Zorkish Shroud and the Lachizalisk cut into his uh, gas production, uh, his gas harvesting. And that means that he does not have enough Vespine for Tier 2. 900 Vespine for that one. Sounds like a very heavy amount of... Uh, requirement, uh, like a heavy requirement for the, the resources. But I mean, this is like 500 of each resource, maybe a little bit more than that. Optectons are very expensive. So, you know, there's there's details, there's details. You'll, you'll figure it out in the game. There's been a lot of thought put into the costs and stuff. Uh, if you guys get into the game and take a look at it, uh, you might have, uh, you might you might be surprised at how how much has been considered already. Uh, with the ski back scab now complete, we'll see if that means Bactalisks or if that means Skither Cores. Uh, going for air units, which is the Skither Core in this situation, is a pretty good option. You can raid the worker lines if you get a lot of them. It does spend a lot of your Vespine, so it further slows down your tier two if you're gonna have it. He made the ski back and then it looks like, okay, now he's picking Ovilus. I was wondering, because then he, he almost had the 900 Vespine required. So I was curious about what that was all about, but he does have some Zuri's Thalets. These guys are uh, frontline tank units. They will absorb the Uptecton shots very nicely. And also, when you attack a unit with the Zor Yusthaloth, it debuffs them, making them sort of like this beacon for other Zerg units in the area to move faster to gap close. And Hydras aren't the fastest moving unit in the game, so that actually can be very helpful for them. In fact, people have been arguing that maybe Hydras are really, really overtuned right now, and that might be the case. You know, again, I, I have to have full deference to either potential options. Uh, the uh, I guess the Avalots are here to scout for witnesses. That seems to be the main purpose of them, but they might be able also be using for drops at some point. Uh, but the reason I bring that up is that a, a, a balance lever to pull might be just to reduce the movement rate of a Hydra. So, you know, there's a couple of options there. Three bases thrumming for both of our players as the natural has swiftly been rebuilt for Hamster. He is now behind in workers and six o'clock is coming operational for Veek. So good expansion attempts over here. Uh, when these last, uh, these two last faced off, Hamster did get the better of Veek uh, two to one in their head to head matchups. Uh, Veek took the first game, then Hamster fixed his config and, and got his hockeys back up and running and uh, just smashed him. So, uh, I mean, they were competitive games, don't get me wrong, but uh, it definitely felt like Hamster was uh, a more comfortably the, the better player. Even the game that Veek won was close and that was with the wrong hockeys, right? So uh, that sort of factors into my analysis for why I, I if you guys don't know that in the cast over overlay, the player who is favored 
board to take the series, the player with the more experience advantage or better head to head or whatever, is always the player on the top. And they, they get the top billing. They're the first name in the in the cast over title. Uh, so they're the player that I predict will take the series uh, overall. So for example, our recent series of uh, Hamster, or sorry, uh, The Shambler versus Hapsaya, I thought because Hapsaya, uh, you know, GG forfeited uh, after playing Invitational B, which is one of our recent uh, invite only tournaments. And then on top of that, we had, um, uh, we had the Shambler, uh, you know, like kind of like taking it to task in the in a very long game before Hapsaya decided to not play anymore. Uh, that was in my mind like, oh, okay, well Hapsaya is just not as comfortable. But then Hapsaya just smacked him three to one, right? So uh, spoilers if you haven't seen that, I guess. But the you know it, it was interesting still, and and you know you can maybe argue those are just more casual games or whatever. They're, they weren't tournament matches, so maybe that whole power ranking goes out the window. Uh, by the way, we have a little bit of a, a fluff here. Um, the Iral Iris was made, but a Vornath Pond was mutated. I'm looking around for it. And that that's the mistake. That should be a uh, Kalkir Lake. That should be the, the the actual tier two structure. And while I've been blabbing about power rankings, Veek has been amassing his army, but six o'clock is under attack. We even have some bar guests here to better uh, bust the army, uh, or the armor values of things like the circuits. And also for that matter, the Zorius, which have the same armor values. Now there's an Uptickdown out here completely surrounded and Veek hasn't noticed it. Somehow it just uh, almost allowed it to get away. And remember it has a pretty good amount of armor value. So it's gonna turn around for one shot, but it probably won't be that uh, effective. We have a total surround over in this situation. And I got to tell you guys, this is the kind of shit that you got to send screenshots of to your friends and family because those kinds of things, those kinds of engagements, they look super cool. You can see the Zorius getting the Hydras on top of those very slow moving up tectons as they try to kite back. And I like the idea, but the counterattack has been even better for Veek on the other side of the map. And he is wiping face of 12 of the not even 12 o'clock. That's the that's the natural base. So that is no bueno for Hamster. He will have to GG and Veek takes the match. Oh, we had Benno spectating as well. He was uh, spectating in the last game too. Just forgot to mention that. Well, there you go, Veek now up to two and zero. Oh. There were only three replays submitted, so we'll have to see if Hamster can get on the board in the next match. Uh, but we like to see those kinds of things. It, I guess the the overall flow of that game felt like Hamster is experimenting with this double embassy style. That's another thing that happens in these more casual casted matches is, oh, you know, people are practicing new strategies or tactics and they've never really played them before, so they don't really know what they're all about. But I really like the idea of, it, of using it for that particular purpose, you know, relatively speaking, how powerful your opponent is. So let's uh, try a different strategy, see if it works out. And it feels like Hamster's economy didn't really stabilize after losing his natural. That gave the tempo back to Veek, despite uh, the Warden opener uh, being a little bit more favored for the Protoss player. And so you just have to factor that into your analysis and say, okay, well, the natural went down, the Warden kind of slowed up the growth of the Zerg, but they went Hydra first, and then that, that obviously made them more threatening, and then you had to respect that more as the Protoss player, so then you weren't really able to boom as much as you wanted to, uh, where you were developing up to three bases with like 80 workers or whatever. And, and then it never proceeded to pass that because he had to rebuild his Nexus in the natural. So I feel like the recovery wasn't really there as fast as Hamster needed to be. Then he went out on the map and lost his whole army, but then he also wasn't in position, despite having all those witnesses, by the way, he wasn't in position to guard against the attack on his third base. So a little bit rough for him, but that is the way it goes. Join us tomorrow for part two of this exciting series.